Ah, yes, friends, on a Monday, the show that you thought may never be again has returned from beyond the grave, from beyond the pale. It's Adam Marbrecht, it's Andrew Makowitz, and we're doing the OGP live on YouTube as always, and then, of course, around your ears if you're listening to it later on a podcast. And over there is the healthy, the wealthy, the sun-kissed Andrew Makowitz. How are we, sir? Adam I spent the last week down in Florida getting getting my tan on. Um, it's been wonderful, but a lot to discuss. A lot of things happened over the last week. Uh, appreciate you jumping in and making sure OGP fans and listeners can, can get some updates, but excited to get back to business. And he also appreciates that as a friend and co-host on the show that I let him do what he needed to do. Enjoy time with the family. He wasn't getting text messages from me every two days saying, Hey, are you ready to record tomorrow morning? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. You're still on vacation. I, I listen, schedules are not my thing. We know this, but, but I, I respected it. I wish everyone could see me do the air quotes, air quotes. but the bottom line is we do get back in together. The big, the big bulk of the show is going to be talking about the schedule. We didn't get a chance to break it down after the official dates, home and aways, and all those good things came out. So that, that is what we're going to do on this episode today. But there were some off season, I think news and notes, and we'll start with, uh, I'm actually going to start with the leadership piece of this because Daniel Jones had had a lot of guys down in the wide receiver group, not, not unlike what Eli Manning used to do, right? Get all the guys together, try to find your rhythm in the offseason. Logan Ryan down in Tampa, so maybe who knows? I, did you partake in the uh, DB gathering that Logan Ryan organized with uh, Xavier McKinney was there. You had Love there. You had Adoree Jackson. Bradbury took part as well, along with Harper and a couple other guys. And I, I mean, I listen, I love it. I don't know what kind of 40 time you put out there on tape, but I think at least you're uh, you're plugged in with the team now. You're one of the guys. Listen, I didn't partake in any of the drills. Um, I, I couldn't risk injury because I'm running around with an 18-month-old around the pool, and, and I can't be having a hobbled hamstring or torn ACL when I'm doing that. Sure. But, you know, we partook in dinner and drinks. Everything was fabulous out, out in Tampa. So highly recommend coming down here if you can. But uh, in all honesty, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's great. It's, it's one of the reasons why when we signed Logan Ryan, we said, oh, he's a good leadership guy. And then you saw his play on the field be exceptional. He yeah. really came into his own as a bona fide leader of this team, so much so that the team gives him an extension midway through the year. Think about how crazy that is. We signed him late. And then we re-signed him early before the season ends. The, the Giants clearly saw the leadership match the skill level that he had. And this offseason is no different. He's taking on that leadership role now that he knows that he's locked in. And the players gravitate towards it. Yeah, and, and really what I like about it too is, remember, this is obviously the defensive side of the ball is where we hope to still stake our reputation this season and you want to see that unit get better right you want to see that continue to develop you're going to have a new piece in a dory jackson and when i think about the idea of logan ryan xavier mckinney peppers on the back end but when you bring in a new piece like a dory jackson you want to see him bradbury and then you know logan ryan being a piece that's behind them somewhere right that maybe has to come down and pick up a coverage assignment if they're going to be blitzing off the edge so understanding how they want to communicate and feeling like you're in a rhythm as you work your way through this offseason is exactly what you want to see on the defensive side of the ball the other news i guess is some of the more recent stuff that we'll cover here i'm actually just gonna real quick um Shoeless KT, any issues with uh, Kadarius Tony? On the one hand, uh, this is a kid that was dedicated to practicing. So when he said the shoes don't fit, he's not going to worry about it. Kick those bad boys to the side. Let's run routes. Uh, Joe Judge, non, as Joe Judgian as he could have been, said, "Yeah, we're gonna. Uh, we want everyone to wear shoes. We'll we'll take care of that. Not not really a lot there." Adam, this made the front page of ESPN. <laughs> I know. Like, think about this. Like, the guy was like, oh, these shoes don't fit. But like, hey, uh, you know, it's for my first time out here with my new team. I just want to catch some balls. I'm not, you know, I'm not kicking anything. I'm just running routes against air. He's like, uh, so I'll just, I'll just run and, and catch a few things. You know, to, to me, it's just, grown grass. <laughs> well, yeah, it, exactly. So it's like, you know, the, the risk, the risk and, and everything else. And, oh, he's a true competitor. It's like, he just wanted to get out there, have a good time and, and uh, not lace it up. But, uh, you know, just be out there with, with, with his teammates. And it, it is funny, updates from all the different beat writers the next day being like, he is wearing shoes. They are the right size. He did tie them. He did the loop, swoop, and, and, and tie. Like, 
amazing, right? The bunny ears go over and around. Um, no, 100%. Were you surprised, uh, you know, Sterling Shepard changing his number to three this offseason? Kadarius Tony is actually going to be 89. Visually, is that going to throw you off at all? Because to me, 89 is not twitchy, speed, bursty player. 89 is lumbering tight end. It, well, that is going to be strange for me to see. Um, I, I thought the same thing. A, a lot of people on Twitter were like, K, you know, KT, Young Joka, don't do it. Change the number. You have the option now. Go with a lower, more electric type number, 89. Yeah, it's, it's right in the tight end zone. Uh, but you know what? You know, other players have done pretty well with, with higher numbers. Um, not a big deal. Whatever he wants to do at the end of the day. Sterling Shepard moving down to three. I think uh, that's what he wore at Oklahoma. Yeah. You know, I, I just like that the NFL is giving a little bit more flexibility in a league where they find people for having the wrong shoelace color or having something written on the side, even if it's for charity. Open it up. Let the players be themselves. It's tough when they're wearing full helmets and masks to get a true personality from someone. So any little things we can do to allow these these players to express themselves, let's make it happen. Yeah, I listen. I'm I'm all for it too. I want yeah. If, if you went lower number, I don't know, maybe like a, you know, like eleven. You know, just double, double I. I don't know. You you think about speed like that, or I mean, a listener, even like the Odell Beckham number. You know, feels like that would be something that maybe you'd want to wear, wipe away some of those bad memories, and almost be reminiscent of it. But that being the case, let's get into one last piece before we move over to the schedule conversation, and that's the signing of a former first round pick. Former wide receiver, actually, now tight end in Kelvin Benjamin. He came in for a tryout, ends up getting at least a contract for the offseason. And then also Corey Clement, former running back for the Philadelphia Eagles. Where do either of these players, you know, stack up to you in your mind? Uh, you know, it's kind of a nice story for Benjamin, I think. Gets to come in. Maybe he's been out of the league, I think, since 2018. A chance to reclaim some form of his career. I I don't know where he's going to fall in the hierarchy, probably behind, you know, safely behind Evan Ingram, behind Rudolph, even behind Caden Smith. But but there's a world where maybe he could fall into the fourth tight end on this roster. It's a very crowded room in this offseason. Thoughts on Benjamin and then even, and even Clement and where he could maybe be in support of Saquon Barkley in that running back room. Yeah, so the, the Kelvin Benjamin thing <clears throat> is interesting. L let me preface all of this. We're at rookie mini camp. Yes, we are. We're, we're trying out players that have been out of the league for a few years. You know, guys, guys like Richard Sherman, who have been in the league, who are still a free agent, are not going to rookie camp right now, right? Like those aren't those aren't the guys that rookie camp is needed for. They're needed for guys that have been out of the league two or three years, or rookies that are trying to make the, a roster. So, like this, you know, the Giants can can sign people and have a ninety man roster before we try to trim it into the fifties for the regular season. So. Take all of this with a grain of salt, but it means we're going to bring in people to compete. On the on the Kelvin Benjamin side, um, man, I, I don't know what to say. There's there's so many different layers to this, and I'm not going to overreact because I, of what I just said. This is for 90 men, and then we're going to trim it almost by half. But Kelvin Benjamin has always struggled with weight issues. Um, he's never been the fastest guy. He's been a bigger body type wide receiver. Um, you know, Booger McFarlane on, on one of the Monday Night Footballs famously said he's one biscuit shy of being a tight end, and now he actually comes in to he try found that out. Biscuit. Yeah, he fa he found the biscuit. He found the biscuit. And, and and look, you know, he's a he's a big body guy. He's, he's six four, six five, and then he's I don't know. He's playing anywhere between they say two forty to two seventy at this point. Um, you know, throw a dart at the dartboard for that number, but. Listen, it, it's pretty simple. We want depth. If you're telling me that he has found a way to use his size to his advantage and he can actually block, I think that's the biggest thing for me. Can he block the tight end position the way we need him to? Or is he just going to be a wide receiver that is on the end of the line trying to, to catch a couple of balls in the red zone? Like If he shows me that he can block a, a, an outside linebacker or a defensive end or chip or, or help out there, then why not bring him in? 
No, nail on the head, right? Because Toiloa is there, also a veteran player, also around 30 years old, right? So if Kelvin Benjamin can show that he can block first, then you also at least think he has the athleticism and the skill set of a wide receiver to be effective in other areas. So that, yeah, listen, we'll see how it shakes out. There's that world where you bring these guys in and suddenly they're not on the roster in another few weeks. And that's okay. You know, we live with those results. But I do think it's nice, at least, that the Giants, you know, we talked about it after the draft last year, spent so much energy going into undrafted free agent, rookie free agents and bringing guys to bring up the level there. Now it's kind of about balancing out some of maybe the veteran presences on the roster. Yeah. And, and actually, Adam, when we talk about the Corey Clement signing, um, you know, former running back of the Philadelphia Eagles won a Super Bowl there. I actually think there might be a, something a little bit more than the Kelvin Benjamin thing on the Corey Clement side, just because of the way the depth chart uh, breaks down for the running back position. You know, Joe Judge and, and the coaching staff said they saw a really good burst from Corey Clement, which is encouraging. You know, uh, Clement is from uh, New Jersey, played high school ball in New Jersey. He's only 26 years old, you know, and, and so when you think about he's not necessarily got too much tread on the, uh, you know, taking off of the, uh, of the tires. For me, when, when you look at our, our running back room, he kind of slots in as the fourth running back right now with an opportunity to compete for a roster spot. If Brightwell doesn't look good in camp, mm-hmm. you have someone like Corey Clement that could step in, and then then the running back room has veteran leadership and presence across the board. You know, and it's funny, too, because it makes you think that, right, maybe Clement is on this roster when the season starts, and then as you work your way through and Brightwell comes along and you want to make another roster move, you have flexibility at a couple of these positions to say these are guys that have value to us early and maybe fade late or entrench themselves, right? Brightwell, it, for his positive as we may feel about sign, you know, bringing him in in the draft class. It doesn't, you know, he's not a make or break for us this year. We hope maybe punches in a couple of goal line, uh, you know, big plays for us along the course of the season. So I like it too. They've rebuilt this running back room in a different way from the last couple of years since drafting Saquon Barkley, where it feels like there is real depth, real experience and talent behind Saquon, as opposed to waiting for a guy like Allman, who we we knew and loved, but waited for him to finally figure it out, right? In the final year of his contract, you'd rather have a little bit more stability behind there. Okay, let's get into this schedule now, if we can, because this is the, this is the meat, this is the meat and the potatoes and the salad. It's the appetizer, it's the main, it's the dessert. What I really, all I want to get to really here is what is what was your initial record takeaway from this? But but along the process, there's some nice things that balance out for the New York Football Giants. Uh, one of which being that they don't have any more than two road games in a row at any point throughout the course of the season, which I think is really nice. Uh, they do start at home with the Denver Broncos, and they'll play two out of their three division opponents in the first five weeks. What was your initial takeaway from the way the roster, uh, the the schedule broke down for Big Blue, and do you see potential snake bit bite games on either side that we can catch a team off guard, or just which are going to be tough matchups for us? So, the, my initial reaction was I liked the way the schedule set up as a season ticket holder of the New York Football Giants, ah. and, and, and you know I want to go that angle first, and the reason why I say that sure is because. Can. Oh, well, well, listen, <laughs> there, there's, there's a couple things to think about. If you're a fan that likes going to the games and you look at this you know, schedule, there's a couple things you want. One, as many home games as humanly possible early in the season because the weather's nice by the Meadowlands. You, can, you, you don't need to be uh, you know, putting pieces of cardboard underneath your Timberland boots uh, while, while you're shivering in the stands. <laughs> so as many early games as humanly possible – is great because the weather is great in September, October, and even into November. The Giants have quite a few, uh, you know, front-loaded heavy home games, which is great. The second piece of it is primetime games should be on the road as a season ticket holder. And why do you say that? It's because nobody wants to be driving out to, you know, MetLife Stadium at 5 or 6 o'clock on a Monday the Monday night football game with all the commercials gets over <laughs> at midnight and you're home at like one 30 in the morning, exhausted, probably had a few drinks and you're like, Oh, well this, this week is toast. So seeing the fact that the giants go on the road to Kansas city and on the road to Tampa Bay, if any of those games are getting out of hand, either way, you can just turn that TV off my friend and roll over and go to sleep. So, you know, er- early thoughts from, from a giant fan is the schedule actually lays out really nice, for watching it and attending the games and, and, and home and away splits. 
Not 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 a bad note to make there, certainly. And listen, uh, I mean, shame on you if you roll over and go to bed during a difficult game at home. How dare you? You stick through all the way to the end. That's good. Good. Those are good notes. Now inside of the games themselves, I feel like, and this kind of came out the last handful of days at the end of last week, that more of the chatter around what Denver is and, and the things that they added to their team. I, I feel like Giants fans in general were like, sweet. Home game, Denver, win week one. And you take a step back and you just say, listen, that's going to be a tough game. It doesn't mean that I don't think that we that, that we can't win. It isn't one of the more winnable games on the schedule. But you start with Denver. You go on the road to Washington. Then you get, you know, Atlanta at home, shootout kind of game, good offense. You feel comfortable about it. But, but where, you know, walk me through, man. Where do you see this record shaking out? I mean, you know. I said official, you know, official schedule breakdown. I think as we get towards the end of the preseason and we see some glimpses of this team, we can start to solidify what we think they're they can do here. But we exchanged text messages. You know, I mean, you got them to eleven wins. I think is where you ended up standing. I, I said ten and seven was my mark, kind of, you know, to dance the line here. But with a shake of the head, I feel like Andy was. Oh, I was just being tongue in cheek when I threw uh, those eleven wins out there. No, I, I, I mean, we got to go check the receipts. Maybe we'll post it on Twitter or, or Instagram. You know, Adam. The, oh, the oh, oh, oh yeah, we'll check the receipts. Oh, that'll we, get. Out we will need to check the receipts. You know, when I look at this schedule. You know, aside from from the games being friendly in terms of a viewership perspective, it's a lot harder than I, I anticipated in terms of, of the timing. So we get we get Denver, like you said, week one. Their roster might be just as talented as anyone else. The problem is they don't have a quarterback. Now, there's still conversations and communication going on about Aaron Rodgers. That game could flip from the Giants potentially being a, a favorite to the to the Giants getting points at home if Aaron Rodgers joins the Denver Broncos. So yeah. that's a challenge. When when you look at the next game on the schedule, short week against the the reigning division divisional champ, the Washington football team, on the road, not an easy game for for the for the Giants to have. That's a that's an interesting little wrinkle there. You know, you kind of think if you could chalk up one and one to start the season, you'd probably sign up for it early. And then the next two games are against teams that have a lot of unknowns in the Atlanta Falcons and the New Orleans Saints. And uh, Arthur Smith in in Atlanta is saying they're going to play up tempo, they're going to play fast, they're going to try to outscore people, presumably because their defense is terrible. But he really wants to get the you know the offense going with Julio Jones, Matt Ryan, Kyle Pitts. Now um, you know they really have Calvin Ridley. They they've got so much talent on the offensive end, but there's still unknowns on defense. And then you look at New Orleans coming up after that. We don't even know who the New Orleans quarterback is going to be. We assume it's Jameis Winston. You could see Taysom Hill for a little bit. You kind of hope that you could get both those games, but I think it's more realistic to, to split one and one. And so for me, I'm looking at two and two out of the gate just with, with the, how the schedule comes out. Yeah, no, it's funny because it's almost like you're playing, well, we'll be going down to New Orleans to take on Sean Payton. You know, I mean, that's what it feels like now without Drew Brees. Now it's well, and, and that's not, and that's just as tough, right? I mean, it, taking on the mind, taking on a really good coach, where you feel like no matter what, it's always going to be a difficult, you know, task to beat a team like that, especially on the road. So to your point, because basically, you know, we could go through, and I think that that, that early start is certainly an interesting stretch there because. Following that Saints game, they get into an on-the-road against Dallas. That's back-to-back -back road games. But then you come home for the Rams, the Panthers, before you get Kansas City and Las Vegas. Those are three out of four games that, again, same thing, though. You'd like to say, could you win three out of four? Maybe. But the Rams are going to be a different team now with Matthew Stafford under center. So what does that look like? And you know or you think it's going to be a difficult task to beat Kansas City in Kansas City. So games like Las Vegas, games like the Carolina Panthers, both home, those are games that if you want to have a good season, you have to be checking those off as wins. And that's not about saying that Carolina isn't a team that isn't improving, that Las Vegas wasn't a team that was vying for the thought they could get a deep playoff run last year, right? But if the Giants want to be a decent team this year, they're going to have to get those wins. What's interesting to me is that where you really end up is, and I, I kept en ending up, I can go through it and say, well, you, you beat Denver. I can go another scenario. You lose to Denver to start the season. Maybe you steal one on the road from, from Washington or Dallas early in the year. You come out of the bye week, though. Tampa Bay, Philly, both at home. The Miami L LA Chargers, those are two back-to-back -back road games that become interesting. But then the last four, at home for Dallas, on the road for Philly, at Chicago, home for Washington. Four games. I really see it that the Giants, every time that I, no matter which way you slice wins and losses, I keep seeing the Giants being 
six and seven, seven and six, seven and seven, you know, in that range going into those last four games. And you can even maybe pull it back and include Miami and the Chargers in there if you want to. But I think those last four games, you've got three home, uh, th sorry, three divisional games in that stretch and arguably the easiest quote unquote away game that you have against the Chicago Bears. That that could end up being the season right there. You could go from seven, you know, from seven and seven to 11 and seven. Maybe it gets you to, or that'd be the 10 and seven, excuse me. That'd be the finish there. Geez, 17 games. Good Lord. You know, so maybe you're seven and six heading into those final four games. Go three and one, get yourself to 10 wins. Give yourself a real shot. Maybe you need to run the table at the end. It's when the Giants could be hitting their stride. I, and I, I'm saying this positively. It could all come down to those last handful of weeks and key divisional games. And also, I think the Giants are going to be competitive each and every week and be in the conversation throughout the year. They're not going to have, hopefully, this two and five start to the year or something that we've seen in recent memory. So that brings up two good points, Adam. The first one that's an extra little nugget of intrigue is that Bears game, the, the yeah. second to last game of the season at Sol Soldier Field, January 2nd. It's going to be frigid. The, the the crazy thing is we don't know who's going to be the quarterback for the Bears on January 2nd. You assume that it'll be Justin Fields by that point, unless uh, Andy Dalton is just continuing to captain the ship for, for however he's doing. But the intrigue for Giant fans is we have that first round draft pick next year for the Bears. We can actually make that draft pick better by winning the game. So like it's a double win for the Giants at the end of the season. And if the Bears are out of it at that point, and they have nothing to play for, and they're putting Justin Fields in, and they want to check out the youth of the roster, that's even better because that draft pick is going directly to the Giants. So that's that's a key game to to, to monitor. And uh, the second piece of it that I, that I see, Adam, is uh, I keep looking to schedule, and I keep saying, oh, man, it's it's tough. You get the Chiefs on the road. You've got the Bucks on the road. you got the Rams at home. You're talking about the, the you know three of the teams that are going to be projected at, you know for the tops to, to win the Super Bowl. But honestly, if we're if we're being completely honest, the New York football giants, we all think they've gotten better. We think they have better depth. We think Daniel Jones is going to perform. If that's the case, you have to win the games on the schedule that are available to you that you're going to be favorites. You're going to have to beat the Broncos. You're going to have to beat the Falcons at home. You're going to have to beat the Panthers. You have to beat the Raiders. These are teams that are coming to the Giants. The Giants will be favored in these games. And if they are the team that we think they are and they progress the way that they are, we shouldn't be looking at at the Panthers game and be like, man, Panthers have improved. They, they right. got Sam Darnold, you know, coming in to back to midlife. It's like, no, no, no. If you're a good football team, you're going to be favored by four or five points in that game. You need to dominate at home. You, your defense needs to take over. And Daniel Jones needs to progress and get better. So, like, these games need to be wins. I, I'm kind of starting to look at this like, if Daniel Jones performs, we're an 11 win team. If he just stays the same or regresses, we're going to lose all of these games. It's oh, all yeah, riding on Daniel nine. Jones. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. and it's no, no. And it's just saying, throwing it out there is like, and then we'll be a, you know, below 500 team, or maybe you limp to 500 on the strength of the defense in a lot of ways. It, it really does. And that's why I think when we talk about why, well, why are, are, you know, the over unders being set at seven games, seven and a half games for the giants this year, right? Why are the numbers so set so low? It's because there's still a question mark about Daniel Jones. If you're, if you're a giants fan, if you're Andy, if you're myself, you look at this and say, I mean, to your point, you know, Go out there, beat Denver, beat Atlanta, beat Carolina, beat Las Vegas, at least take three games in your division. Now you're up to seven right there. You're, you're at seven right there. Steal a home, steal a game on the road in the division. Okay, fine. But maybe you got to go out and beat a Miami or the Chargers, beat a Chicago. There's eight, nine, like there you are, right? And right. That's, that shouldn't be out of the spectrum of possibilities. And yet we sometimes find ourselves still going, Oh boy, that's asking a lot. They're like asking a lot of what? Asking a lot of, you know, a high powered offense and a very solid defense. So I think it's it's a slow, a slow burn for me up to the point where I'm like, yes, the Giants should win games. The Giants should be good enough to, to get something done here. The the way that I'm looking at the schedule is we will know who this Giants team is by week three. I, I'm 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 fully convinced that the first three weeks will show us who the Giants are. You have Denver at home. You have to win that game. You have to hold serve, especially given that they don't even know who their quarterback is going to be. You look at the Washington football team. 
that's a tough game, short, short week on the road. But man, if the Giants win that game, win a division game on the road, short week early on, they could be 2-0. and They would be heading home to play Atlanta, who has no defense to, to speak of. And the Giants could presumably walk out of those first three games 2-1 and one or 3-0. and If they lose to the Washington football team and they lose one of those home games and they're 1-2, and two, I, I, I don't see how those other games we just talked about that are winnable on the schedule – all of a sudden look really appealing and you're going to say the Giants are getting to 10 and 7. I had talked to to, to pessimistic Mike at one point and we're doing exactly the exact same thing. I'm like, you know, Denver, Washington, Atlanta, and then you get two road games, one's, one's a divisional opponent, right? And I said, I was like, you know, there's a world where you can come out two and three or I don't know, you know, whatever. And, and it, 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 he was right though when he said, yeah, then you're not a good team. You know, the first five weeks, like if you if you're not three and two coming out of those games, then you're not good. You know, if you don't beat Atlanta, if you don't beat Denver, like if you don't beat one, you know, you're not that good of a team. Then you have to at some point it has to be expectations have to be set and then they have to be reached by this team. The the thing that I'll say to book and to book your point is no more than two games on the road at any point of the season. But the reason why they need to do some work early on is even against the Rams, maybe the Carolina Panthers at home, the Vegas Raiders when they come to town is because they'll have three out of four when they come out of the bye week, Tampa home for Philly. And then it, then it's Miami and chargers on the road, Dallas at home. And then it's two more Philly, Chicago on the road. So when you think about the amount of games on the road, on the back end of their schedule, it's actually heavily loaded away when, when you look at it, because that's going to give them one, two, three, four, five games with two at home. Five on the road, two home games after the bye week. So it even changes my my opinion a little bit about what they need to do by the bye week of this season. Seven games, so the first ten will get played before your bye week. If I'm then if I'm looking at their record, I have to, you got to give me at least six and four out of the first ten, right? I mean, you have to set that table because road games are hard, no matter who you're going against. Uh, well, the, the simple thing to, that we're all circling the wagons on is if you play the Carolina Panthers at home. And you and don't expect them to be. Over. Yeah, yeah. Over, yeah. Just, you, you can't dump winnable games. You're you have to go up against the Kansas City Chiefs on the road in prime time. You have to go up against the Tampa Bay Bucks on the road in prime time. Those are games where the Giants could be seven to ten point underdogs that you don't really think they're going to steal. But there's other games that we may be able to steal on the road. Those are probably going to be unlikely games to steal. But we cannot be dumping games at home to non playoff teams. That's the whole idea. And you know, to, to, to pessimist Mike's point is like, then you're just not a good football team. If you can't beat non-playoff teams at home, then what are we even talking about? Now I, I will say the giants sitting at seven wins as the over under for, for the season. So they're saying eh, it's seven and 10. I would be very high on taking the over for the giants there. When it gets to seven and a half and you say they got to get to eight and nine, that's kind of where I see the schedule right now. Mm. But again, if Daniel Jones, takes one step forward, not even three steps forward, takes another step forward and he's solved some of these turnover and fumbling issues and he can hold on to the ball. I think our defense is strong enough to carry us to at least a couple of wins, especially given when you look at the schedule, some of those teams that we're going to be playing still don't have a quarterback or their quarterback situation is shaky at best. And that's where the giants can really come in. The way that I look at it is how many games will the giants have the better quarterback on the field mm. when they play. And you look at the Washington football team right now, you'd say Daniel Jones is probably better than, than Ryan Fitzpatrick. You look at the Eagles. Do you know what Jalen hurts is? You, you look at the, the, uh, the bears, Andy Dalton or Justin Fields. Even the Andy, Saints, right. You could argue, right? Yeah. The saints. So, so the list goes on and on the Denver Broncos, who's their starting quarterback. There are going to be at least half the games in which we have the better quarterback and our defense is probably better than their defense. If you can't win those games, then one of those things is off and we need to figure something out in the offseason. No, 100%, man. And I think the Atlanta, Carolina, Las Vegas, those are the three games before the bye that automatically have to be checked off as wins. And then maybe even to your point, as we'll get out the door here at the end of the day, if you don't beat the teams that don't have quarterbacks or have the question marks, the quarterback position, if you want to throw that into the mix, that makes Washington a very, very, very strong defensive team. Also a beatable team because you do need to get that ball out to all those weapons that you have. So as we always say, the divisional games, right? Splitting it and going three and three, that's technically fine. You know, they're always going to be rough matchups when your homes lose on the road. 
But if you can steal a sweep in there somewhere, all of a sudden you're four and two in the division that gives you that extra win. And then it makes it easier to take on some difficult matchups like the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, like the Kansas city chiefs. So, Hey, this is our all too early, all too early review of the schedule. We won't commit anything hard. Andy had him going 13 and four, I believe was the last time that we had those records come out. Uh, I was a little more modest in mind. I think it was actually 15. I think 15 and two is actually what Andy said initially, but listen, all we can do is assume that I'm being honest. We will, of course, be back in later in the week. Andy Makowitz possibly on site from Florida. If not, though, we'll continue to cover the New York football giants as we move through the offseason. We won't worry too much about some of the riffraff and the details on the outside. Let's continue to delve into some of these opponents we're going to face the upcoming season and set our expectations for who we want to see rise up here. We'll review the rookies and how they've looked. The big question that I want to kind of dangle out there as the show tease is, Ojolari, what happened? You know, what is it? What is the instant starter, instant impact player? What about Smith, right? Let's set the table for what we'd like to see over this course of the offseason. Because I've even seen out there, even seen it out there, as depressing as this may sound, somebody said that Nate Solder will be starting at left tackle this year. Blasphemy! You can follow us on social media at One Giant Podcast. Of course, listen, download, rate, review, subscribe. Five stars or bust if you can on the podcast wherever you get your needs fulfilled. And as Andy Makowitz would love, would like, would need, and demand that you know. As always, even from Florida, let's go Big Blue.